everybody and uh, welcome back to our channel we all just saw the the sixth episode of the rings of power titled udun and we're here to chat a little bit about about the episode with with you all um this episode probably by the time that you're gonna be watching our chat it's a few days will have passed since the episode but we're literally recording it on the day when the episode aired so all our thoughts are still pretty fresh and to chat about the episode with me here today are strider hello there mr strider hello hello <laughs> uh great to, great to be here wherever and when because i am not sure when this is going to be airing but hello everyone and welcome to our chat hello good sir to your neck of the shire woods and uh on the other side we have mr hen hello Hi, hi. Happy to be back always. I love, you know, these chats. So it's always a privilege to take part in them. I think this was probably the most chatty introduction you've ever <laughs> had on a video. I'm so proud yeah. of you. Oh, wow. Um, okay, so first first impressions. How, how did you guys feel? Did you like the episode? Um, did it meet your expectations? It was, I think it it was one of the better episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, the the things I have issues with, kind of kept happening, but I mean I think yeah. it's just going to be the situation with the season. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think overall it was a very fun episode, and we finally got the sense that things you know are actively happening now. Yes. People are moving mm -hmm. around, doing things. Plot mm -hmm. is definitely moving forward and escalating and so on. So mm -hmm. yeah. It was it was one of the better episodes, definitely. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think I still think it's kind of a mixed bag in so far as you're right. This is now this is the payoff to all the setup, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know there's been so much setup. You kind of expect the payoff to be like sort of I don't want to say worth your time, but you like worthy of all that length that you have trudged through. And it's like, it's good. It's definitely one of the better episodes. I always watch it twice before we do this. Mm -hmm. And I could watch it a second time pretty easily. It wasn't like a huge, oof, I have to watch it again. You know, it was very like, and it moves. Yeah, but it's still, there are still uh, certain bones to be picked with it. We'll get to them later. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I quite, I quite liked it too. I wouldn't say it's one of my favorite episodes so far this this season. Um, I did feel that maybe the hype was a little bit too big going in, and it was really interesting how this this huge set piece, like the culmination of a lot of the storylines this season so far, uh, happened in a very actually small scale battle just like a, a tiny tiny village battle which i thought was surprising i mean on the other hand you know this is this isn't just a village this is a home for for a couple of our main characters so uh from that perspective i totally get it um but yeah all in all i really i much preferred the quieter character moments the to big action pieces uh i thought some of the conversation throughout the episode which were indubitably going to be talking about uh were very yes. very interesting and yes but uh, I, I thought a lot of the character arcs got a big push this episode uh we finally saw some character development that i thought was severely lacking throughout the the season so yeah. um so, it's yeah. interesting once the character are, the characters are put under duress mm -hmm. that's when the characters like the, the character drama starts making more sense even though it like yeah. it, like in your head it shouldn't like work work quite like that mm -hmm. but it does uh yeah i agree it's it's so hilarious that normally it's the very quiet episodes that bring about more character development whereas here <laughs> it was the most action heavy episode of all that actually had the most dialogue etc yeah in because the plot was character really building good. dialogue yeah yeah All right. Um, should we just go right into like from the beginning of the episode on? Is that okay with you guys? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so what happens here is Adar says a uh, new life in defiance of death. Yes. 
which again comes up later on with Bronwyn and and Arondir. And I thought that was really interesting. So we see here how, you know, Adar is still very similar to, to the Elven characters that we get to know. Some of the costumes seem to be very similar, which a lot of people pointed out was maybe didn't make quite as much sense if Adar was in fact turned... Uh, taken in by by Morgoth at the very beginning, um, it wouldn't make that much sense for his customs to be similar to the customs that Arondir has presumably later on. Yeah. If you know what I mean? Because these are like cultural yeah. things. This was the exact same quote that they used. And I think they just wanted to emphasize the common Elvish, Elven background. Um Yeah. It's but just yeah. it's always it's always a compelling thing to draw parallels from antagonist to protagonist. Mm-hmm. In this case, from both to Aaron Deer, but later on, I think also to some extent to Galadriel. Mm-hmm. And the costume thing, yeah, I think early on I was telling people like, I think it's done just in a general. Oh, that's how elves. That's what. That's the kind of thing elves wear. Yeah. So that was the logic that went into the design choices of Adar. Yeah. I'm but still I did wondering... like. Yeah, yeah, I did like the finish. opening. Um, so I'm I'm wondering, is it like will he end up seriously being just a random elf? I mean, still obviously a very important elf, but you know, just like in a random elf, uh, elf in the sense of that he's not already mentioned in the books. Uh, yeah. Because he he did say that uh, thing in the last episode, the one before that, that he w- once went to to the river mm-hmm. in Beleriand and mm-hmm. so on. So he was yeah, that the, was just because someone saw random... Apocalypse now. Yeah, but, you know, maybe there is a story to that. We have two episodes to find out. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if we will, but it's, a, it's still something that's kind of hanging there in the air and, you know, it can mm-hmm. have some sort of payoff in the next two episodes. I was thinking the same thing throughout this episode. Um, I was mostly wondering, because we did have a, a leak a couple of months ago that Adar is, in fact, one of Galadriel's brothers, right? And I kept thinking throughout this episode that I kind of don't see that happening. I don't see that being the case, especially given that at least to me, it now, and I know we're going to be talking about that later, but it looks like Halbrand is very, very likely to, in fact, be Sauron. So in my opinion, it would be really weird for Galadriel as a character to be dealing with two sort of shrouded identities within a couple of episodes. So first she, she would be like, I don't know, recognizing Adar, I don't know, her realizing he's her brother, which would be a huge emotional shock. And then on the other hand, the same episode or an episode later, there will be Halbrand, you know, turning out to be the Dark Lord, which is pretty major. So I don't see them doing that from the dramatic perspective. I don't know. I agree. I also think, I think that the story that she tells, oh, you're one of the kind of primal elves, Mm -hmm. the first elves, is like, you don't have, and this is the same issue that I have with people saying, oh, the mithril thing is bogus. You don't have characters, your main characters tell stories that turn out to be wrong generally. Mm-hmm. Usually if they tell a story, especially with a great deal of detail and elaboration in it, it's going to turn out correct. It's not going to, and the, you know, it's a whole conversation. He seems to, you know, confirm Mm-hmm. Uh, he isn't like a duplicitous character necessarily, I think, or we're not supposed to take him as being. Yeah, I mm-hmm. think he's. I, don't, I think the Galadriel's brother thing is very thankfully bogus. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on your part, Strider, or do we move on to through the plot? Well, line? yes. Um, I think Hen said it very well. I don't think uh, what she said is. So I think it's it is the truth because you don't really have time, and especially this show doesn't have time to have characters just saying random stories for no reason at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I yeah I think it it is as it is uh, as it sounded, but I'm still thinking that that mentioning of the river maybe I I still think and I hope that there's going to be something fun in there, but I, the way they're going in the show about. Uh, making some things much simpler. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps it, it was indeed just uh, an offhanded comment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, possibly as well. Um, all right, so then we have, um, I think, a few shots of 
Numenorians traveling east. Um, we have Galadriel getting acquainted with Isildur, which I, I really appreciate it in that scene that we actually do see Isildur, you know, tending the horses. I thought that was that was a really nice touch. Um, and then we have their conversation on the um, on the deck. What did you guys think about that? That was quite something. <laughs> yeah, Strider, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I I liked it overall. I, I think. It, it was a cool moment to, to see Zildur seeing Middle Earth for the first time. Yeah, mm-hmm. especially seeing nice what's going to happen, mm-hmm. and you know that's that's the actual general area where he will indeed um, come come of like of the of the ships. Mm-hmm. Uh, he will plant that famous stone and so on in that area. So I think it was a really nice moment, mm-hmm. and some people were not happy with how Galadriel figured out that it was Isildur or something like that. I that, saw some comments true. that people were not really happy with that, but I think it's not a problem. Like, yeah. it's Galadriel, it's more, actually, it's, it's more book uh, accurate Galadriel for her to be able to figure out, okay, this guy is Elendil's yeah. son, than not to oh. be able to do that. So I think for yeah. me that was yeah. pretty okay. Yeah. On a mechanical yeah. level, I think. Mm. On a mechanical level, you're very right because he just says his name and she's like, ah, you look like your father. <laughs> and we, we, we never saw him refer to his children to her by name, but that's just mechanical. Like, I don't mm. mind that as long as, as long as it moves the story forward, fine. Mm. And in terms of the content of the conversation itself, it's, you know, the one thing about it that I kind of dislike is dressing it up in this very military jargon. So she's referring to him as, uh, what was it? I think, like soldier or soldier, something. Soldier, yeah. He's calling her commander and she's telling him like at ease and stuff. All of that mm-hmm. brought a little like formality into it. Other than that, it was very nice. Uh, and the shots like sun rising over the sea, very lovely. Yeah, yeah. I I thought some of the some of the things said in that little conversation, and later on when Elendil comes in as well, were pretty interesting. Uh, yeah. I I very. thought we got a good insight into Isildur when she's talking about you know take pride in in the work that you do, uh, even if it's humble. And he makes it perfectly clear that he's not interested in any sort of career that would humble him. Uh, I, I think he comes yeah. off quite ambitious in that scene. And then uh, later on when Elendil comes, I really appreciated the the quote by Elendil, uh, we're sailing into the dawn, yet to me it feels like the coming of night. I thought that was such a magnificent thing. Um, I do think that um, maybe, you know, as, as a sailor, he would be at some point... Uh, he would be faced with a situation, I don't know, somewhere around the southwestern part of Numenor when he would, in fact, be sailing towards Numenor when it's when it's dawn. Uh, but still, yeah. I really, really appreciated the whole the whole sentiment. I, I thought that was absolutely lovely. Mm. It's nice the, that he ends with like she asks him about basically his wife mm-hmm. uh, and he's like talks about as you said, something else. And then at the end, as he walking away, she drowned and walks away. Yeah. That was was interesting though. I thought, I felt it was a little bit out of, out of character for Galadriel to be prying about that. I don't know. To me, (laughs) I I mean, she died. It's obvious she died. Why, why do you need to know the details? I, I I really didn't like that. I mean, we Um, can wear it off as her, um, Feeling that that event may have some deeper impact uh, on Isildur's or as Elendil's future motivations or something. So yeah, that's why you can I pass mean, it off. We, as we, that, we yes. can, we can, yeah, we can pass it off as that. But yeah, I agree. Like on, she was just kind of asking the question if we are looking at it from like the technical point of view. I th- I, I think so. I agree with you, but I I think they could have maybe packed it up a little more subtle you know and then it perhaps include a, a, a question that would explain the reason for her prying i don't know maybe mm-hmm. maybe it's just uh, a, a personal thing but uh, I, I, will, I just want to make a quick comment uh alan Dill is awesome he, he he keeps being a, a really 
he he keeps on feeling like the guy who you would actually want to be in charge. Like you would like him to be your commanding officer. He has, yeah. he definitely has that commanding pre- presence, but that is in a way also like protective, you know, of, of those below him. And I think that casting was seriously spot on. And in this scene, as in most other scenes, he really shines through. Yeah, he has. He like has his, yeah. Yeah. He has stuff to do in this episode. Other scenes we'll get to, I'm sure. I, 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 I quite like him in this episode, but I don't think I liked char- his characterization so far too much. I, I really didn't like his relationship with his children. I, I didn't think that was healthy parenting, parenting at all. Oh, it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, he was really he was treating Isildur pretty poorly, and he was and dismissing. Arian. Arian completely, so I'm not a big fan of the character so far. But uh, but yeah, but Lloyd oh, Owen I, does does a decent job. Yeah, I I yeah. agree that he wasn't really presented perhaps in the greatest light. But I'm just talking more about his like the the feeling of him as a person. Mm-hmm. I yeah, think, I get it. I think he's he's a really good Elendil, or he could mm-hmm. be a really great Elendil, depending on of course what the people behind the show give him. Mm-hmm. What, what material they give him, give to him, mm-hmm. but I think yes. it's a really good casting. He's really mm-hmm. carrying the role. Like you, you can definitely look at him and be like, okay, yeah, I can yeah. absolutely see this guy becoming the high king of honor yeah. and wonder in like three seasons. Yes, I agree. He has that leader charisma. I would say um, I could, I could see his, you know, the soldiers under him trusting him a lot and relying relying on him. And I could see him being somebody people elect as king. So yeah, in that in that sense, absolutely. Um okay, so now if we move, we have Adar arriving in in Ostirith and I thought it was really interesting because that was one of the moments in the trailer, one of those really dramatic moments where you see, you know, this huge army coming to the tower yes. where they're hiding. And then in this episode, you see that actually happens like as soon as the episode is, you know, begins. And it yes. actually turns out to, to be not a particularly dramatic moment, given that they've all fled. And I found it really interesting that um, when they when they come to the tower, one of the orcs says "Gimba tool," and instantly, I mean, you you see in the subtitles what what it means, and instantly everybody who's seen the Lord of the Rings more than five or ten times will instantly recognize this from the Ringverse. Um, so yeah. I thought that was a really nice touch. I really like how they're putting little you know snippets here and there that will feel familiar to to yes. viewers to readers um, yeah. there are a lot there are a lot of little callbacks in this episode but most of the time they don't they they work well and mm-hmm. speaking specifically of this the moment i saw that Osterith was going to be under siege i was like uh that, will this feel a lot like helm's deep and in the yeah. previous episode it was shaping up yeah. to be like that thankfully mm-hmm. it wasn't that at all uh mm-hmm. that was a very pleasant surprise mm-hmm. I yeah, agree. that was that was a yeah that, that was definitely a nice choice that they made there. And um, as Akitia said uh, at the beginning of this conversation, uh, that we go to the village that actually makes uh, makes sense or like that that's very important for the characters. However, <laughs> I mean I don't know if we we can talk about it now or maybe later. But mm-hmm. still, the scale of the whole thing, I never felt. At, at one of the previous episodes, I think two episodes ago, they say all the people from the villages from here to Orodruin are here now. And it's yeah, like it was, still it was like small. 55 people on the screen. Oh, and that's it, it true. And it's like all of them. Mm-hmm. That's, so that's, yeah. yeah that, I that's, think that's that, a very important point, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very. but I, I, I'm very willing and <laughs> to hope that the reason for that is the pandemic, which would really make sense. And I yeah. can definitely see that it's for sure impacted the production uh, at some point. I think yeah. the filming was stopped for like a few months or something. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I'm hoping that it's just that, but I am I do prefer the fact that they went to the village rather than staying there and just playing it off as Helm's Deep. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. I do think all these villages are shown to be very small places though. So I don't find it that yes. implausible because if you, if you take a look at Theo and Bronwyn's village, I mean... It's really just a couple of houses. So I could absolutely yeah. imagine each of these villages to only have about 50 people or something. And then half of those people 
left and joined the dar anyway so i could see yeah. this not being too big a crowd it's it's, it's 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 all very plausible plot wise but again mm. having been through so much build up yeah. you'd expect it to be bigger yeah. and it's it's quite small it's a yeah, small skirmish it, very inventive seem, but yeah. it's small okay so on to the 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 battle itself um take it away <laughs> what were your feelings impressions did you so, like how we it was talk done? about it maybe maybe like in two parts because it kind of had two parts yeah sure like the, sure the, know, the like first the attack first and the second and yeah sure yeah. so i think it was pretty cool to see them being inventive and you know like setting up the mm -hmm. i mean you know you saw that like in the seven samurais or the magnificent seven mm -hmm. um and yeah, the other seven movies, samurai. It, it, yeah it, it's it's really yeah, it's cool. seven samurai Okay, well, I prefer Magnificent Seven, so I will stick to that. <laughs> but yeah, indeed, uh, it, you know, it makes sense, and you should, of course, of course, use everything you have in your village. And it's yes. again, you have the advantage of the home field, so that also plays that not an important role. But yeah, I, I was pretty happy with how they approached that, and it was a really good twist that the orcs used uh, human, like uh, traitor, traitorous yes. humans as the cannon fodder for the first attack. It was a really, really, mm -hmm. really good plot test. Yes. So I was quite happy with yeah. that. Yeah, I always judge these scenes. I always judge action... One of the ways to judge action set pieces is can you, like, a while after, like, recall specific beats? And I certainly can do that. They push, like, burning cards to close them in. Mm -hmm. Very much out of the scouring of the Shire, basically, minus to the fact the cards are burning, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Uh... Um, Aaron Deere has a nice one-on-one -on -one with a really big orc. That was, uh, you know, you can remember all these beats in both attacks, actually. Mm -hmm. So that's always a good mark for an action set piece. Again, just a little bit, maybe a little bit small for me. After all mm -hmm. this time, it feels a little small. I agree. What, one thing that I did notice and I really appreciate it was when Arondir is waiting for, you know, the attackers to arrive, staring at the, the empty dark horizon, and then little lights start to appear on the horizon, right? Yes. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but with each light, another sound is heard. And ultimately, it's just like, I don't know, are there some sort of bells or I don't know, just like tiny, tiny twinkling sounds that remind, remind us of, of actual lights, you know, twinkling. Yeah, fire. And uh, yeah, the fire. And eventually, like all the sounds joined in, in a little polyphony. And I thought that was that was done very, very well. It was very subtle. I didn't notice it first time around. But the second time around, I, I thought it was done really nicely. I like that it was done out of focus. So they were all like the mm. like this bed of bokeh behind them. Mm. Very, very yeah, nice. Nice too. I didn't notice... I didn't notice uh, what you said because I actually haven't had the chance to watch it the second time. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely pay attention to that. And yeah, it was... I, I think they did a pretty good build up there for the whole mm -hmm. battle. I think I'm I'm quite happy with how they handled it. Handled it, even yeah. though, as we have said already a few times, uh, the scale definitely felt mm. lacking. Yeah, it felt lacking. Okay. And, and one of the things that I think that was at the first part of the attack, yeah, uh, when Arondir realizes that some of the dead bodies were their, you know, fellow village folk. And stuff. I thought that it was it was played up as this sort of revelation. I don't think it would be that that surprising. I mean, those people did actually, you know, switch sides. I think it was to be expected that they would be sent to battle. I mean, yeah, they were dressed up as orcs, which was misleading, etc. But I didn't feel like that was that big of a surprise. I mean, you mm. would expect that to happen. Mm. All right. So just before we move to the to the second part of the attack, uh, I have a, a few quick thoughts that I just wanted to to share. Um, I absolutely loved how that one person fell off the roof once hit by an arrow. It was such a wonderful. He was just like sliding down the roof. It looked mm -hmm. absolutely amazing. I appreciated that a lot. Um, I also wanted to say, and this will refer to some stuff later on as well, but I really hated how there was no real tension. We absolutely mm. knew that that Arondir was not going to lose the eye. Um, oh, yeah. And later on, I think I can I can safely say that a lot of us knew that Bronwyn was not going to die by the way it was shot. 
yeah. I did think she she might die before the, the battle began when they were talking about having the garden together, etc. When I was watching that, I went like, oh. <laughs> like with so, Antomo last time, who didn't yeah, yeah, die, yeah, yeah, yeah. at least yeah. until the explosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was something that I noticed. And also, uh, I, I just wanted to point out, because I didn't know it in advance, uh, I, I had to look it up, but the Nampat, you know, the thing that the orcs are shouting and the, the music is also titled Nampat, uh, right. that actually means death in, um, you know, the black speech. So I thought oh. that was that was pretty neat. I don't find it a particularly threatening word. Like I mean, the Rohirrim use it, though, but yeah. Oh, it's Nampat, okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I thought that was interesting. I I I did not know this in advance. So. <laughs> Do you guys have any last thoughts about the first part of the attack before we get into the second part? Yeah. Well, I I would just uh, say that I do agree regarding the tension. Mm -hmm. I was I was also I, I was also thinking that one of the original characters from the Southland spot, which is basically everyone, um, mm -hmm. is like is quite likely to bite the dust by the end of the season. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I do agree that the way they go, they went about uh, Aaron Deers and Bromwell's death threatening scenes mm -hmm. uh, were not really... I think Aaron Deers' scene would have benefited more if it wasn't for that like uh, arm wrestling contest, contest, like will he mm -hmm. get the knife in the eye or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it would have been a huge Game of Thrones level surprise if that happened and, you know, it just won't, won't happen. Yeah. So uh, I, I think, and, and as for, for Bronwyn, definitely, they didn't, like, it felt like it was just one thing that was happening because if the main character is going to die, it's going to be in a more dramatic, more personal scene where you're getting more from them. This was like after the battle. On the sides. Yeah, or something like that. After yeah. the battle. Mm -hmm. I thought so too. Yeah, I, I don't know. Just the way it was shot, it it never made me. Maybe just for that one second, when when she seems to have already died, and they show Theo's face, for one short second, I was like, okay, maybe. But then ultimately, they keep showing her the, from afar, and you just know that she's gonna move. I I absolutely knew because that she the was shot move. because the shot holds very long on her. Yeah, on I her. Think if the shot rather had than long, on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if the shot had longer held on Theo, yeah. we could have bought it, but no. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so okay, so the, uh, the the second part of the attack, Adar arrives, and we get we get this this pastiche of shots from the village with the villagers, you know, taking refuge in the in the inn or whatever that is. And on the other hand, we also see Numenorians arriving. And I thought one thing that kind of puzzled me is that the Numenorians are arriving with the like the rising sun behind their backs, which means that they're riding west. I couldn't quite figure out how, how why they would just go around and then back to, to Tirharat. I mean, I, I suppose they just did it because it looked cool to have, you know, yes, the, the I, sun behind yes. them. But I was like a little bit bothered by it. I mean, if if they came with some sort of explanation when when they were talking about uh, how to get how to get there, you know, when we were looking at the map, I would be okay with it. But in this case, I just thought it was a little bit silly. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, I mean, again, we can always, you know, uh, house rule it as them. You know, they had to go through the mountains. Mm -hmm. Again, the whole process of them being able to in one day go from the wherever they uh, came on shore mm -hmm. across the mountains, across the southern Italy and across the mountains, all the way to Tirhad is <laughs> very, oh. very stretching it mm -hmm. very, very much. Uh, again, we, we don't have that treatment of distance properly yeah. at, Not at all. all yeah. It just feels like, yeah, it's just, it just, it had to happen. So it happens. But if we, if we, Put that aside for a second mm -hmm. we can pretend that you know like well they were passing the mountains they had to go you know around. somewhere around but i absolutely agree mm -hmm. that the way you just described it yeah totally it's a bit you know yeah it does it does absolutely require you know s suspension of disbelief to a certain degree 
Um, I think it's me, one of those cases where we're willing to do it, though. Yeah, we're us. quite willing to do it. But for me, this sort of things like the Numenorean sailed from literally the other side of the world. Oh, and, totally. And they, yeah, that's they arrived to Tirharad at just the right minute, you know, just to prevent the disaster. Yeah, I it think also Elendil. I think Elendil actually says to Muriel that it's going to take three days. And it doesn't. It takes a night. <laughs> so, I think yeah. that's the sort of thing that's that's similar to what they did in Game of Thrones, uh, a certain mm-hmm. scene in episode uh, in season seven, when some people were waiting to be rescued. They were trapped, surrounded by the enemy, and then eventually I saw that help episode, comes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they they try to because some characters need to travel a very 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 long distance and the raven as well and they were just like you know they just sort of made it out to be you know this um non-specific amount of time and i think they did try to do the same thing here um but yeah but i was i was i gotta say i was a little bit surprised by how bloody the the whole treating bronwyn situation was given that Um... Okay. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was you know with with us showing the wound and then the the blood dripping on the on the floor. Mm. I think in in some scenes this show is certain scenes it's treating very very clinically very clinically in the sense yes. that it's it doesn't show too much blood it doesn't show too much gore and not in in some 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 other scenes you just see blood and guts and stuff like when yeah, Halbrand yeah. was was fighting the the Numenorians in Numenor you know the the, the guild people I yeah, was surprised by by how that that gruesome that was um and here again, I, I I was a little bit taken aback. So I thought that was an interesting choice. I, I did experience, we were told this episode was going to be quite bloody. And I guess because mm-hmm. a lot of the blood was in darkness, so it was cast mm-hmm. in deep shadow, it was very, you know, it wasn't very, like, red. Um, yeah. Or it didn't come across looking very red. I didn't experience it as too bloody, but, you okay. know. No, but it I, wasn't, I think all in all, it wasn't bloody at all like we we only see it in in a couple of shots when it's strictly necessary for the story we don't see that much on on extras etc uh but in these scenes where they really want to want us to feel the you know the impact of her wounds Mm -hmm. and you know how badly damaged she is they just go all in and they just really show it (laughs) so that kind of surprised me a little bit um, and another thing that surprised me in that scene was that Arondir was actually willing to sacrifice Bronwyn yes in in the second attack, yes, I was yeah. like, oh, okay, like yeah. that. That was an interesting it. surprise. Yes, yeah. that was a surprise. Yeah. And ultimately, how they deal with this scene is that later on, when he and Theo are talking, it's actually him who's being like, "Yeah, Theo, don't beat yourself up over you know wanting to betray the location of the sword." I I fully anticipated the situation would be completely reversed, and Theo confronting him with, "You were willing to sacrifice my mother." Are you insane? I mean, sacrifice her. You know, I mean, she he he, he didn't say anything. They were gonna slit her throat. He wasn't giving away the mm. location of the sword. So, in my opinion, as a thirteen or fourteen year old boy, or how old Theo is supposed to be, I think he would take that very personally, and he would be like, "Are you serious? I mean, does she mean this little to you?" So that that kind of surprised me a little. Yeah, bit. it was it it was a surprise, but honestly, uh, I was pretty um, nicely surprised by Aaron mm-hmm. decisions here. And I don't know, yeah, it makes sense. I agree that I would also expect uh, Theo to have uh, an opposite reaction of what of the reaction yeah. he had after the battle. Yeah. But I don't know, maybe they're trying to port- portray him as more grown-up-ish of sorts. Mm-hmm. Because he bit. does feel more serious than we we would I think usually imagine someone of his mm-hmm. age so maybe that's like a cautious choice and it was pretty okay. cool and I, I it was a very nice twist they did avoid the cliche of, I, I think of mm-hmm. Aaron Deere being the one to, to say. I think that that was a very good way to go around it and uh, mm-hmm. I'm very happy with the choice regarding Aaron Deere. I, I, Aaron Deere I think it was a really cool character moment actually also for him and for Bronwyn. Mm. And I felt it was really good that we finally saw some some re- relationship progress both with him and Bronwyn. 
Yes. And with him and Theo, and also Bronwyn and Theo, I felt that so far this season, we didn't get to see what their relationship is actually like. But in this episode, we get that nice little moment when he, like, because Theo is still a kid, you know, and he asks her, you know, can you, can you please comfort me a little bit? You know, can you say the stuff that you said before? And this is also another case where the writers included some lines from, from the actual, you know, Tolkien text. Yeah, I, I, I didn't like that as much, but yeah. That's the one callback that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. The lines, mostly over Sam's there. I I liked most of it. I didn't like the eventual, you know, you know, the, the, if you find the, the light, the dark will not find you or whatever. I didn't like that part. But the, the first part, I thought it was quite on point. And I thought it was quite moving too. I think this could be something that a mother would say to a child. Oh, yeah. Um, so I thought that was quite nice. Um, all right, so then we have a couple of action shots of Numenorians riding in. Um, what did you guys think? Any, 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 and some, some stuff that maybe stood out to you? Well, that was one moment for me um, as they are riding over the bridge, mm -hmm. and then as they pass the bridge, they are spreading out. Mm -hmm. I think that was a really cool touch. Mm -hmm. Overall, it was. Again, it, it's a weird setup for for this big battle. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what's going to happen in the next two episodes because this happened in the sixth episode out of eight. Yeah. yeah. So that that's a, that's a big question. But overall, I think it was all right. Mm -hmm. There were some nice shots. Um, I'm happy that that the main characters were like the Numenorians were carrying helmets. Mm -hmm. Again, the, another thing with, with which that goes. Mm -hmm. um, that, that often happens in Hollywood movies is that the main character doesn't wear a helmet and so on. So we see yeah. the other see two main characters not wearing helmets. And then we have a Valandil falling down. Like, mm -hmm. okay, that was a good excuse. He fell down mm -hmm. and then he lost his helmet. So, okay, that's, that's one yeah. way to do it. It was done nicely. But, I noticed that too. Yeah, but, but you need a helmet in a sword fight. That's yeah. a fact. As, as much as you don't use actual swords in practicing mm -hmm. sword, sword fighting, uh, what, what, which, which we had in the previous episode. Yeah. So that's what was, I think there were some really cool uh, practical things that did there, such as that uh, movement of cavalry, cavalry after the um, past the bridge. But then again, there were some other Hollywoody type things that you know you kind of expect that we are kind of used to that. But it would be cool to take the other the other route and try to make it more realistic because they would all mm -hmm. wear helmets there because they have the access to helmets. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I still, yeah, I still thought it was just a little bit small still, even with the riders and the orcs, it's just what feels like two, three dozen people on screen, a few mm -hmm. hearts around, a little bit small, a little bit mm -hmm. small. Yeah. Yeah. But otherwise it's very pleasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is. I there were some moments that I really liked. Um, for instance, when Halbrand saved Elendil, I thought yes. that if indeed he turns right. out to be Sauron, I think that's gonna be that's amazing. That that's a really nice wink um, to to book readers. Um, and I really liked when he he when Elendil got swarmed by the orcs just before that. Because he's like this big hero character, you know, and then you actually see him not, not, it wasn't this sort of an aesthetic little, you know, injury he takes or, or I don't know, it was, yeah. you know, he was, he was literally getting, getting swamped by them. So I thought that was, that was pretty neat. Um, I like the more actiony part of Halbrand that we got to see, hmm. um, that we got to see here. And uh, and then we have the the little chase that happens when Halbrand and Galadriel jo wow. <laughs> join join forces to hunt down um, Adar. He would so... just be, be, before we move move okay. to that because I think it probably deserves like a section of its own. Um, I I very much agree with seeing Elendil mm -hmm. in actual peril. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. That was really that was a really nice touch, and he was basically saved two times by Isildur and by Halbrand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that was yeah. That was definitely one of the things they did well because you were like, okay, you know, if if for a random show watcher, mm -hmm. who, you know, for like someone who is new, who is not, who doesn't know really who Elrond is, who doesn't know mm -hmm. about duel with Sauron and all that, I think yeah. that could have been an actual moment of 
oh well, what's gonna what's going to happen to him? Is he going to die? This is this is going to be like motivation for his yeah. son and so on, you yeah. know. So I think that was yes. a pretty good good spin. Yeah, I yes. thought I thought so too. I did want to make a little criticism, and I think you guys might probably not agree with me on this one. But I did feel it wasn't very realistic that we have this Numenorean cavalry, you know, riding into battle and everybody was, I mean, we do see them take some hits, uh, but everybody was just so, so proficient and everybody just handled the situation so well. I believe this is an army that hasn't had any practical experience whatsoever yet in centuries at this point. And then they come, I mean, I feel like, and I understand that these are Numenorians we're talking about. They're supposed to be, you know, this superior race of men. But I feel like they would they would find themselves on a battlefield and being very confused because the reality of a battle is nothing like the, the training ground. And I kind of feel like they would be overwhelmed. They would be, okay, yeah. wow, this is... And a good thing is that Ontamo... Let's actually yeah. refer that a little bit, you know, because he's disillusioned. It's not what he expected. And I, I really like that. But I felt that mm. the whole situation, yeah. everybody was just so smooth. Everybody was just so, you know, in charge of the situation. I felt that was a little bit, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get your point. I hear it. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, one, one more thing before we move away. So I saw uh, again, and it's not unexpected when you look at it at the screen, on the screen, and you see, um, well, Halbrand, but mostly uh, Galadriel mm-hmm. doing those acrobatics on the horse. Mm-hmm. But actually, from what I know, mm-hmm. um, I think that, uh, for example, the Mon- Mongols were famous for doing those type of things, and you can find videos of. I don't I know. I think so. Yeah. I I just found a video today. To show to a friend uh, some yeah. Russian music video, whatever, and then like yeah. the Cossacks are doing that for fun, basically. Like they have yeah. festivals where they are, you know, practicing sword fighting and horse riding and so on, and they are literally doing that, those things, and even crazy things. So the, I just want to say the, that yeah, it the happens whole in... thing that God is doing there, it's it's actually quite realistic, quite possible, yeah. and something that actually did happen. Yeah, maybe not with a suit of armor, but yeah, but you you know, like the the what's his name? Like he's the knight hospitaller, I think, in Kingdom of Heaven. He does that move. Oh, he, the... he looks super cool. Yeah. Oh right, yeah. the yeah. guy who yeah. plays um, David. Yeah, the... Harry Potter. David yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. David yes. Thoris, yeah. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and it's super cool there. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I absolutely great. Very great. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. All right. So then we move on to the the little. Chase, um, yes, yes. I I thought that was that was. There's a lot to unpack there, as far as I'm concerned. First of all, I want to say that I really, 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 really appreciate how they showed the horse being okay. Uh, after ah. Halbrand throws Adar off the horse, you then get this extended shot of the horse getting back on its feet and just you know walking away, which I really appreciated. That I really didn't need any animal cruelty. I know it might not be the most realistic, but I absolutely love that. You usually do that in movies, uh, yeah, in shows. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they do, or they show them die very, very gruesome death, which I'm very happy we didn't get to see here. And then right after that, I I felt. That was a really interesting character moment. Adar is on the floor. Halbrand approaches him and he stabs him through the hand, right? I thought that was a really interesting moment where Halbrand was again showing cruelty that wasn't necessarily completely warranted. I feel like he could disarm him, take, take control of the situation without stabbing him through the hand. Yeah. But he did it. Obviously, you know, he's feeling vengeful towards him. But I feel like this is another moment that, you know, this is not a very heroic trait he's displaying here. We've already seen that yeah. to a certain degree in Numenor when he was fighting the, the, the guildsman. But here, again, we have a situation where he's really letting his anger bring out the cruelty in him. Yeah. I, I think we are meant, though, to see in both cases, like, oh, he's like the rogue, you know? Like, it's supposed to be kind of cool in a sort of kind of perverted way. But yeah. Yeah, possibly. But I just think that they're trying to subtly let us know that he is, in fact, not a hero. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. 
I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I think the, they are giving us, like, you know, what you said, the fight in, 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 in Numenor, mm -hmm. and this now, mm -hmm. they're definitely showing us, mm -hmm. you know, this guy is not really that great. Yeah. I and, think, you I know, when, so when whatever the reveal is, it's going to be like, yeah, okay, I mean, he did tell us he wasn't really good, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so then we have the um, the scene where Galadriel is interrogating Adar. Possibly I, the core of the episode, I think. I think so, too. I think so, too. It's this co confrontation, and I think this is a culmination of her uh, storyline so far, actually. Mm. Um, there was a few things that stood out to me when she she had the quote she said when i was a child i heard stories about elves being taken in by morgoth i thought that was a little bit int like weird when she was a child really in yeah. in valinor that sort of that's, rumor would yeah. reach her ears for real i yeah, kind of don't see creepy, that happening yeah, yeah that's creepy yeah. and it's also i just don't find it too plausible i mean where would those rumors originate there were no you know, telegraphs going from Middle Earth where these elves will be taken in by Morgoth and Valinor, I suppose. I don't know. That one, that one. No, felt... but I think, mm -hmm. I, I think they were, I, it, it's been a while since I read that Silmarillion, but uh, I think it's possible that those, uh, some of the elves were also caught before, uh, yes. like because when a oh. thing covers oh. them. Yeah. yeah, the elves. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, a, there's before, quite some time before they actually yeah. get there, so it's yeah. possible that Morgoth had the chance to do this while yeah, yeah, yeah. Elves, before the elves started on their journey. So I think it, yeah, yeah. it's possible. So before she it's was possible. even born. Okay, I see. I see. Yeah. yeah, I take it back. Yeah, that makes much more sense now. Yeah. Um, mostly, I thought this this was a really, really nice sort of juxtaposition of Galadriel versus Adar. Um, in the sense that w when he says to her, uh, wh what's the quote that he says that both of us were uh, shaped by darkness, something like that? Yeah, I'm not the only elf who was shaped by darkness, something to that effect. And that disarms her, it kind of makes That completely shallow. disarms her. And I the, perhaps you should, you sh you sh your quest for finding your, uh, for you looking for your enemy should have ended in your mirror. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> That one was why wow, my. I, I did. That I did painful. think the the cruelty on kind of on her side was maybe play just a tiny, tiny, yeah. tiny bit too much because she is meant to be. That's one of those scenes where we are meant to feel. I think like mm -hmm. Olga Ledgeville is in the wrong here, mm -hmm. but it's still just a, a little too much. I just agree. It's 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 way too much in my opinion, and I know that I at least I think that that's the point of this scene. You know, showing that she's taking her vengeance too far and also showing that Adar as a villain also does have some, have some qualities like some of his motivation is quite noble. He He's trying to help out his people. He's trying My to children help. have no master, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. his children have, have no master and you know the whole, his whole reasoning for, you know making Mount Doom go kaboom is to yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> in order to, 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 to help them, you know, go out in the sunlight I mean, in during daytime. Um, so I think they're trying to to show us that everybody is a little bit gray here. Uh, he has yeah. good qualities. Galadriel has bad qualities. Um, and I thought that was interesting. I'm not quite so sure how much that is. Her cruelty to this degree is in tune with what Tolkien intended for her. I don't imagine Galadriel from the lore being this bloodthirsty. Yeah. Um, no, this is definitely sense. pushing it. Yeah, yeah it's pushing I, it I a think bit. it's I think it's pushing it. And the whole scene still didn't seem that that much off, but I, I thought no, it, no, was it was great. A little bit uncharacteristic. But yeah. all in all, I think it cemented Adar as being a very compelling villain. Yes. We've very. only seen him for the last I think this is the third episode that we've seen him in. Yeah, and in previous mm -hmm. ones, he wasn't necessarily in it very much, but he has a great he, screen presence. He, exactly. He has this great screen presence, and the way that they're developing his character, I feel, is very compelling. He is fantastic. And actually, I had a, kind of a wild idea today, and I abs absolutely do not see this happening, but it would be so badass, and it's based on the technicality. Okay. Um, it's based on the technicality, um from somewhere 
I think maybe Elrond's council or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is said that uh, in the Battle of the Last Alliance, there were members of all races on all on sides. Both sides. Mm -hmm. ah. Oh, that's true. Elves. So what I'm hoping is, I know it's absolutely crazy. I really do not see the like spending time to do this, but it would be pretty cool to somehow have Adar survive all the way to the Battle of the Last Alliance. I have some hmm. chapter of orcs that's, you know, like a different breed of, you know, like the yeah, gray orcs or something, you know, like the grayish type of orcs and just be there fighting against Sauron. Yeah. It's out there. It's crazy. It's whatever. But I love Adar so much. I would love to see him stay oh. as long as possible yeah. and mm. even have like an Adapt Shark because I think he's such a great character. I really, really, really like what they did with him. And especially the actor, the actor nailed it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I I really felt for him, especially when he was giving that speech that you know he just wants to give them a home that they're they're worthy of a home. I thought that was really moving, and that was not something that I would expect ever being said about orcs. Uh, but I also found it really you know, interesting what he said about you know him killing Sauron. Splitting him open, yes. Splitting him I open. I think he did. I mean, Sauron has this annoying tendency to come back from the dead. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he he also, I think that was something a lot of us feared that they were, you know, done away with. Um, he did point out that Sauron at the beginning of the Second Age, you know, tried to heal Middle Earth. He wanted right. to put things in order, which is something that I that I find very important in the lore and something that I, I really, really, really hoped that they were going to stick with and not just present him as this all out villain. And it's mm -hmm. also one of the things that make me think that, yeah, this could potentially, I mean, in my opinion, it's very, very likely it's, it's in fact, how brand because when you, uh, yeah, you, you see him having this very, very, you know, visceral reaction to Adar. He immediately wants to stab him. Later on, Adar tells us, you know, I, 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 I killed Sauron. I mean, I split him open, which, yeah, would, would make somebody pretty pissy. Um, and then just before he leaves, when Galadriel has already left, there's yes. that moment where Adar asks what, him, who are, who are you? Are you? Are and you? It's, it's like this tense moment and the music, the, the, the Halbrand it's... music plays. It's I not think, only a tense moment. It's yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's. It really points to the direction of us trying to start believing that maybe he could be Sauron. Um, but one thing that does maybe confuse me a little bit is that Adar points out that Sauron, you know, he really likes order. He wants to put things in order. Um, Whereas I see Halbrand as this pretty chaotic person. He seems very all over the place to me. I I I don't know. I, I, I find it a little bit difficult to to combine these two concepts. Yes. Well he could be doing some, you know, soul searching in a way, like he <laughs> got betrayed. Uh yeah. you know, he, he goes on like a trip around the world to, to find himself I, I do, that. But yeah. I think like uh, this actually fits with, uh, I think I proposed this theory on one of our Sunday shows mm -hmm. that Adar did indeed get uh, Sauron uh, overthrown in some way with mm -hmm. support of orcs or something like that. And it does kind of fit with that. So it looks yeah. like I, I got it right. I'm very happy that I finally got something right about the show. The thing I mean, that is least, starting. It, it that is like that. So I, I think maybe this was a moment for Sauron to, if Halbrand ends up being Sauron, of course, um, you know, to think about his approach to everything he's doing. And yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I do agree. He looks, he seems chaotic, but he seems uh, a man in, in chaos, but one that's trying to find a place where he can have some peace. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's what he was trying to do when he went to Numenor, at least what he was, you know, he said, this is my chance to, you know, mm -hmm. find some peace or whatever. Also, one yeah, thing I, I noted, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going on, but I just okay, okay. saw this on Reddit it's earlier. Um, it's interesting that both um, Sauron and Galadriel apparently uh, faced the mutiny and in the same place. Right. Oh, yes, that's, that's nice. nice. 
That's I didn't catch that already. at all. No, I didn't catch yeah, that. Yeah, I, I saw. I must have seen the Reddit yeah. thing. I didn't come up with it on my own. Yeah. Well, that's pretty yeah, neat. Yeah. I, I did, though, the thing that tilts me towards Hellbrand being Sauron now is that if he is just the king of the Southlands, mm -hmm. that was the most impotent coronation mm -hmm. scene I've ever seen in my life. Now, it could just be impotent, yeah. like the mythical thing. But at the same time, yeah, the fact that he asks him who you are just before that, yeah, very, very possible. Very possible. Yeah, I thought so too. And it was so weird. Like, did nobody bother to check this guy's credentials? Like, to check his actual heritage? Galadriel says, I think he might be the, the you know, king in exile. Miriam is like, hmm, okay. Yeah. Then we have yeah. the next scene. So this guy is your new king and everybody's like, oh my God, wow. Yes, it's so yeah. funny. It's like, hey, you Bronwyn, meet this guy. He's yeah. your king. You're our king. Hooray! <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it was very cartoonish in a way, or very oh, terrible, yeah, mythical. But yeah, yeah, I, but, I, 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 but again, that's that's that feels like one of the consequences of and having the king of a, like a five houses. To, <laughs> it feels like a, a consequence of them having just mm -hmm. such a such a short amount of time to do all of these things again. We need yes, definitely yes, yes, yes. like at least two more episodes per season, at least yes. yeah. to to make yeah, these yeah. things uh, m perhaps make more sense, be more believable. Because this was absolute. Oh yeah, like he became a king in like thirty five seconds. You know, so yeah. that is true. Yeah. All right, so for the final little bit of our episode review, uh, another kind of the thing kind of takes place at the end of the episode which is a um, yeah, small thing small yeah, thing teeny tiny tiny nothing tiny. important yeah so what did you guys think mordor or or mount doom at any rate goes kaboom yeah Ken, mount... do you want to take this away <laughs> i i i i know that i find this the the least compelling of the whole group it, it wasn't before the episode aired, there were some rumors about how this would go about. Mm -hmm. And they were, the outline of them was very true that this sword, which feeds on blood, is used as a key in a keyhole, which is kind of silly in itself, but that's beside the point. But we thought that it directly activated Mount Doom. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is going to be like, not just silly, this is going to be like mad capillarious. I'm going to watch it drunk and have a blast laughing at it because if you're not going to like something at least you can do as well uh but uh it wasn't ultimately they 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 made it very mechanical so it's mm -hmm. like it's a key it opens a dam the water go into channels which the orcs have dug mm -hmm. uh in which we know they've been digging for a while goes into the oroj ruin mm -hmm. which that's a little bit trickier because if you're coming to this completely new, you wouldn't know that there's a volcano anywhere around, but fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and that causes it to erupt. So mm -hmm. they did make it, it wasn't like magic. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't silly Which, in that way, but yeah. yeah. We were afraid it was going to be. We were afraid it was going to be magic. And yeah. it wasn't magic, but still, creation myths don't dramatize well. They, they aren't mm -hmm. good things to do on screen. I would have much preferred to just have Mordor be there maybe get a little more hellish a little more sulfurous once sauron takes place there settles mm -hmm. there but i would have much preferred it to be there over the reversal of oh it was this beautiful pasture of green and milk and honey and now it's turned into you know hell on earth it's just a little bit strong yeah strider what did you think yeah. well i um i'm quite happy with how it turned out in the sense that you know they they were setting it up the whole the whole season. They um, did. Again, I was again mentioning that I think on the in the previous episode uh, on the sun, of the Sunday show. Uh, this is my third to glow, so I apologize. But you know, uh, I, I was saying like, okay, the the channels were do, there for some reason, and I at first thought that it was maybe yes, you did to share lava, like to spread lava to to Mordor. Mm -hmm for whatever reason, because at that point I thought it was going to be like a magical ritual. So, you know, if we're having a magical volcano, spreading magical lava across the hellish la landscape or the landscape if you want to turn into hellish, I like, you know, it could, it wouldn't be a step too far if you're already going that way. Hmm. However, this was a pretty cool way to, to make this more natural. Yeah, like having the key and that whole mechanism was interesting. It was a very interesting choice. 
uh, to go into the background of who built the dam, who built the river, mm-hmm. how did nobody notice, mm-hmm. things like that. See, Why do you need scary. this key? Yeah, like it's you know, but okay. I can, I can, this is one of the things in the show I can close my eyes and just enjoy it because I think it was a really cool scene. They made, they worked for it. They really did their, you know, part to set this up. Mm-hmm. And it was a really cool scene. The, the shot of, I really wish I saw this on like a movie screen, the shot of mm-hmm. uh, water coming into the volcano. Yeah. That was really cool. So yeah, overall, I liked the whole visuals and the process i'm quite happy with how it turned out because we knew it was going to happen Mm -hmm. so if it's going to happen i think this was a pretty good way to do it i i want to say that yeah congratulations because i completely forgot we chatted about it and i i think i dismissed the idea completely that the the tunnels were there for any sort of lava or anything like that um but yeah as it turns out that was that was absolutely true um, one thing yeah, that's... I'm just waiting for, for ant fives to show up in the group. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that did stand out to me was when we get the shot of the, the water falling down into the volcano itself. It did remind me a little bit of the shot we get at the beginning of uh, the two towers, uh, where we see Gandalf and the Balrog falling in a similar ah. opening, like chamber inside the mountain. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I got that that visual association there. All in all, I'm kind of, yeah, I agree that having having a sea Mordor be created is demystifying for sure. I think this sort of evil things, I think that films and media that that treats um, that 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 goes deep in the psyche of villains of these big mythical villains like villain origin stories, I think wh- whereas they can work well, they demystify the, the person in question, and I think a similar thing is done here with the landscape. We see Mordor being this this evil evil place full of death and destruction and decay. And having us go through the process of a very mechanical reason for all that happening is, in my way, unnecessary. I would much prefer it if Mordor, at this point, were already, you know, a land of devastation. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, because we did hear about this sort of thing happening, I think the way it was done, it was absolutely not as horrible as we all feared it would be. It was visually yeah. spectacular. One thing that did bother me a little bit was that when we, and maybe I'm misremembering something here, but when we got establishing shots of like Tir Harad and everything, Mount Doom was very far in the distance. Like we could we could make it out, but it... It, it was very far. Yes, I did sort of that. It yeah. seemed very far. Whereas in, in, in this episode, it's looming over Tir Harad. And when it erupts, it's just, it covers oh, all the sky. Yeah. Uh, so I thought that was maybe perhaps some inconsistency there. And of course, I'm aware that, you know, different type of lens can make make uh, landmarks appear much closer because, you know, it, it compresses the, the distance and everything. And I'm aware of it. But on the other hand, I, I felt this was a little bit sloppy, perhaps, or maybe, I don't know. I, I wasn't a big fan of that. But all in all, the, the impact of the, the disaster... It seemed pretty neat. I'm worrying, or not worrying, wondering how anybody's going to survive this. Yes. It yeah. seemed like a really, really oh, big, yes. big disaster. Yeah. And also, I thought it was very interesting how useless Galadriel was, ultimately. Oh, terribly, yeah. Everybody was just, you know, trying to trying to help people, trying to get people to safety. Uh, Halbrand was like, everybody get behind the wall. Muriel was leading people they were showing everybody actively involved whereas galadriel just stands there and she's just like oh that's pretty she makes some yeah she makes a motion for us so early on because there are yeah. also orcs breaking away from their yeah. chains there's a lot like happening and yeah, she's like making a move and then she's like nah and she's <laughs> like i think it's like shock and her taking it in and stuff but yeah. it comes across a little bit selfish is not the word but it's like really you you can't yeah. do what everybody else is doing and help just self-absorbed. So yeah. Yeah. I, I will. I will try to find an excuse, just okay. for this, just for the sake of the argument. I don't disagree with you absolutely. Um, 
we could maybe look at it. I mean, of course, we'll have to see what has happened there. You know, we, we have those promo shots of her group going through this post-apocalyptic mm -hmm. uh, landscape. You know, it's, uh, we see that. Uh, so perhaps she was, well, there's one, one thing, uh, the War of Wrath, mm -hmm. perhaps some flashbacks to that. But also it could be um, she was maybe remembering uh, Gil-Galad's words that you will brought bring upon the return of evil if you continue pursuing it and so on. So, like, I could see, you know, perhaps this is so huge and, like, if she, if she is realizing and feeling like that in that moment that she maybe did cause this in some way, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. perhaps that's, like, that would be an, an, I, maybe enough of a thing to uh, stop someone in the tracks even despite mm -hmm. their immortality and so on because if you're chasing for someone for hundreds of years and then you... Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. feel good like something i think like that was the logic you know yeah that's probably i would say that's maybe like you know reason but i do agree that you know everybody's doing something mm -hmm. you know maybe she's like okay i guess we're just all gonna die mm -hmm. maybe that's like okay, some sort of um, dark relief for her mm -hmm. you know yeah. maybe this is how it all ends you know the way they're going with her we this is all i think quite plausible path for her to go through so mm -hmm. i don't know I do think, though, Rakilia has a very good point. This super, very, very cool destruction and wave of, uh, what is it, volcanic ash and stuff, mm -hmm. it's going to feel a little jaded when I, I presume most of the major characters are going to survive it unscathed. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. <laughs> like yeah. uh, Galadriel. She walked into the, like, like yeah. she was just standing there letting that blast hit her. Like, that would kill anyone Nobody. No matter, like, are you like that would kill trolls and probably like I don't know. I don't think even a dragon would be like, oh yeah, that's you know piece of cake. I'll just stand here yeah. like the blast of a, of a volcano eruption. Now there's like the biggest volcano in Middle Earth just blasts yeah. around me. Like yeah. Nobody told her that uh, you know she's in the Lord of the Rings, not Game of Thrones. She's not a Targaryen. <laughs> you know, take, take <laughs> yeah. it easy, there, woman. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I thought that was really weird and especially because we've seen her in the trailer and, and even in the episode 7 promo, I mean, she, she does make it out and spoiler alert, she's still alive by the end of the third age. She doesn't lose her hair or anything. I'm just wondering, right? What, you know, how... Again, how, how having a helmet? Happen? Yeah, Mirio is gonna, count, yeah. Makes sense. Um, yeah, Muriel is gonna survive it. Aaron Deer is gonna survive it. We see him in promo. Did we? Yeah. And, it's and like... I yeah, sorry, Han. Finish. The... No, I'm just saying. Lot uh, every major character almost that we know about survives this, and it's like, yeah, it's yeah. gonna be a little jaded. <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, I. So this is uh, a warning for everyone. This is a potential spoiler for the next episode. Uh, I haven't seen the promo, so I don't know. If maybe it's in the promo, but I, I think so. Again, spoiler warning for the next episode or two. Um, didn't we have a leak? Uh, that Muriel will be injured in Middle Earth. Ah, okay. Oh, that is Did true. I, 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 yeah, I, I remember this? something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, people, and maybe I, I even saw something people. about going blind, perhaps. Yes, I, yeah, that was, that was I saw thing. people on Discord say, "Oh, Fellowship of Fans reported that she was going blind," and I was like, "Did we?" But I guess we did at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Oh, did what did the, oh her father said? That uh, what awaits her darkness. in the world is darkness, ah. and it could be that I, she I changed it. As darkness. Yeah. I changed it, anticipating the rumors to be true and the episode to be insane. I changed it to crazy stuff, but yeah, <laughs> stupid stuff. Silly, I can't okay. remember, but yeah, but uh, yeah, darkness, yeah. I did find something that um, that Strider, you just said, really interesting. How um, Gil Gallet pointed out to Galadriel that you know, or in his speech to Elrond, that if she were to stay, she would be the cause that evil would return. Right. So what I kind of fear that's going to happen here is that Halbrand is at some point going to reveal his identity to Galadriel. Her reaction is going to be absolutely visceral, and they. In this episode, they explained that at some point at the end, at the beginning of the second age, Halbrand was striving to do good. He was trying to, you know, bring order to Middle Earth. He was trying to heal Middle Earth. And obviously, Sauron, you know, yeah. uh, yeah, Sauron, pardon me. And obviously, the way he went about it wasn't 
perhaps ideal, but at least they're really trying to reinforce this idea that his intention was good. So I could absolutely see them going the route of us seeing Halbrand, who is in this scenario, Sauron, you know, still trying to do good and trying, trying to be good. And ultimately he reveals his identity to Galadriel or she finds out about it some other way and she completely rejects him. And that could be the the cataclyst of what eventually pushes him to, you know, the dark side. Yeah, 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 yeah. Terrible. I really hope that's not what's happening. I really, really hope that's not what's happening. Yeah, definitely. But I kind of feel like that might be what's happening. Yes, I, I feels agree. Like the I'm next logical scared. step. Yeah. I'm very scared because they have that moment in the woods almost yeah. on the cusp of being romantic. Yeah. And so to yeah. have like his motivation to go evil being her rejection of him would be yeah. like, ah no someone pointed it out to me on discord vx1 but uh yeah it was like and i didn't think of it and when he said it i was like ah no yeah but yeah it, it makes sense sadly and i was i i also find it so hilarious how when the first trailer for the hobbit came out for an unexpected journey and in the trailer we see that little moment between galadriel yeah. and gandalf in rivendell and everybody just lost lost their you know, everybody was like, wow, they're going with this romance between Galadriel and Gandalf. How horrible this this would never happen, etc. Well, this show is giving us, you know, at least the the beginnings of a romance between Galadriel and Sauron, which in my opinion I mean, is more outlandish. Yeah, they're, they're definitely like, you know, there's that line and like mm -hmm. half of a scene, The Hobbit. And yeah. once you see it, you're like, you know, OK, it's, yeah. you know, respect, platonic, whatever, you know, yeah. it's, it's all right. But the, the show has been dancing that line this yeah. whole time. And yeah. seriously, I, I, I don't see... Especially now. Especially coming now. Back from, yeah, especially now. I don't see Amazon's uh, or like the show's reputation and my mm -hmm. connection Amazon's reputation with this project <laughs> coming back from any sort of romantic involvement between those two. Mm -hmm. If that happens, I, everybody's going to lose it. Like, I think even... But they're still going to watch it. I I can see a lot of um, more lower conscious fans just dropping this, mm -hmm. and even even people from who have just seen the movies perhaps who haven't necessarily uh, watched the books, uh, read the books. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Yeah, just it's no also way. just that's, cheesy. that's not supposed to happen. I will say it's cheesy and I agree with you and a lot of for a lot of people that will be absolutely you know one step too far but on the other hand I don't think it would be on the scale that it would actually hurt the show itself I think the potential that I think they made the the and please this is you know for the record I 1000% don't want any romantic tension mm. between Sauron and Galadriel no, thank you. Not at all. Even Halbrand, if he is not Sauron, I don't want it. Please don't let it happen. Mm -hmm. That said, I do think that they've portrayed their relationship so far in a compelling enough way that it won't bother most viewers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't see this being the thing that breaks the show at all. Uh, I think this is the thing that will piss off a lot of fans and it will piss them off magnificently. And I agree with that and I understand that. But I don't think that long term it could hurt Amazon and it could. Yeah, not com not commercially. No, I not agree. commercially. No, true. But I think that this is like if this happens, this show officially goes it, like from adaptation to fan fiction. If that happens, that's absolutely for me personally, at least that definite step too far from. Oh, totally. lore, from mm -hmm. Tolkien, from anything that makes sense in Middle Earth. If that happens, this is just a fan fiction TV show, not an adaptation. You know, um, you can always say adaptations are a kind of fan fiction for obvious yes, reasons. They but are. This is they like, are. okay, this is not an adaptation anymore. We are just mm -hmm. doing our own thing. Yeah. Whatever. Also, this is so huge. So huge. Especially when you pile it up on top of the Mithril thing and now the Insta Mordor thing and all that, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. And to and me, it's just it would just be cheesy and yeah. unnecessary. Yeah, I agree, and I, I understand why they wanted the the two characters potentially. Of course, we don't know that Halbrand is Sauron, but I really I believe it at, at this point. Uh, I do see the value of them having a close relationship, a, a yes. sort of friendship, even. 
I don't think it's necessary, but I do see the value of of it for this particular story they're telling. I I do understand that, but I don't mm. need to turn that romantic. I think his betrayal or his actual identity could be devastating enough as it is with their relationship being a friendship. You don't need to bring the romantic component into that. So absolutely, I, I, I think so far they handled. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, um, I just uh, wanted I to. Lost. I just wanted to finish that. I don't. I don't think they're going in a specific romantic way i don't think anything romantic necessarily is going to happen but i do think they're consciously you know dancing on the line on the verge of it for sure i think so far they handled you know like if, if you look at bronvin around their their mm -hmm. romance mm -hmm. uh, i think they handled this very tactfully actually mm -hmm. i will i think i think a lot of us had fears how that would turn out especially because you know Elves and uh, men, they, that doesn't happen really that often. You know, there are like three known pairings and all of them are crucial in the mythology of Tolkien's world. And we all had our fears. I was definitely one of them. But I think they actually handled this, at least so far. We'll see what happens uh, after this episode. But so far, they handled it very tactfully. And I'm hoping that they will actually do the same thing yeah. with Halbrand and Galadriel. Okay, they, we danced on the line, but we will not cross the line. Okay, fine. I'm absolutely willing to leave that in the past and just move on and just, you know, take it as a part of, yeah. you know, making the series more compelling and so on. But mm -hmm. as long as they do not cross the line. Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, let's hope it stays like that. All right, folks, any final thoughts? How would you rate this episode out of 10? Oh, Oof. <laughs> Um, that's a good question. So I like to, I like to, so, uh, again, Han has definitely, uh, we talked about this before. He has a different approach to these things. Uh, for me, I would say, um, I like to rate this show on the scale of fantasy shows and movies and so on. So I would say uh, specifically on the scale of like high fantasy shows we have, we had so far, I think it's pretty high, like an eight or a nine easily. But then again, the bar for high fantasy shows is not really high, so that's yeah. kind of uh, I we, just we, judge it as a not show, a great yeah. way to do it. But yeah, Han has like a more overall, like a general approach to it. So yeah, I just judge it as a show. Up. And as a yeah. show, thus far, most of the episodes that I've rated, you know, they average around six or seven, and this is definitely dancing around those lines as well. Mm -hmm. Um. Like the action's good, but the final contri the contrivance of Mordor at the end kind of hurts it. And something else that we didn't talk about, which I'll mention very briefly, only Southlands in this episode. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Nothing. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very peculiar choice. Uh, Is it? Like it, it works for the episode, but for the show as a whole, the fact that storylines are missing, this storyline is missing from this episode, this storyline is missing from this episode. All of the storylines are missing from this one. Like it's, and in spite of one of the storylines being put on a timer, in mm -hmm. effect, and another one of the storyline having antagonists just introduced to suddenly throw them out for a whole episode. Very weird. So yeah, I'll go. With, I'll go for that conceit and the Mordor thing. I'll go with the six. Like it's it's pleasant mm -hmm. as it always has been. It looks good. It's the action's good. But it's a little small, a little, you know. I find it really interesting because we did uh, earlier on, we, we talked a little bit about how we would rank this episode among other episodes. And Han it's one of the better ranked ones. it among the, his better ones. And I ranked it somewhere in the middle. I wasn't too impressed. And still, his overall rating is lower than mine. <laughs> I think mine would be somewhere around seven for this episode. Um, so, yeah, I did ballpark. I didn't mind that much that uh, this was the only storyline that, you know, took place in this episode. I think this is very, very, very common in TV, especially when you have these big episodes where just like uh, a big battle is taking place, etc. It's very common that only, you know, one plot line would, will take the center stage. Uh, so I wasn't bothered by it, but I wasn't particularly impressed by the episode either. I think it was done very adequately. It was done competently. I didn't like yeah, some of the... The show. Yeah, most of the show. I didn't like some of the, the choices that they made. I thought it, they were very cliche, but all in all, it was pleasant enough. The, the, the ending was very strong. Um, so yeah, that, that was about it. 
Um, I think it's definitely not uncommon, as you said. Like, for I think Game of Thrones did the same thing a few times. Yeah, you know, like I, I think the the battle when the wildlings are attacking the wall, I think, is like a subcontent episode. And I, actually, this was kind of a good moment in the season overall. Like, I do agree that you know there are plots happening that we maybe should be seeing, but actually, I think it's a pretty good. It was a pretty good spot to make this cut. Because um, the two yes. other main characters in the other Morvan Elven storyline, they're on their way to a region. So, mm-hmm. okay, they will, will kind of have this time for them to transition, to, to transition over there. Yes, and I think that's the logic, to, yeah. yeah, and we need the Harpoods to get to the Grove, which is closer and closer to Mordor. However, the thing is that I'm afraid that we will see we we will see El, um, Elrond and Durin in the next episode, but I don't think we will feel they cross the distance. Again, the whole concept of them just, mm. yeah, just let's just go on a hiking tour across Eriador. So, yeah, but overall, I think this was a good moment to make this cut yeah, and just I focus guess, on this I, big storyline. Yeah, I guess part of the issue is that we've waited so long for this setup and we for this payoff and we mm-hmm. waited for this payoff, we waited for this battle. All mm-hmm. the lead up was to this, mm-hmm. not to whatever is happening in the next two episodes. This mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. to have it just happen <laughs> is a little bit like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, I agree, but anyway. I cannot wait to see uh, the hobby storyline. I'm yeah. actually very starting to be very excited about that. Yeah, I missed them this episode as well. Yeah. I think we've been very, very long in our review. So I think we have to slowly say our farewells. Um, it was an ex- absolute pleasure to to go through this episode with you guys. I hope we get to repeat it next week. Maybe we'll have to condense it a little bit more. Uh, but at any rate, this was lots of fun. So thanks. Thank you both for joining us. Um, thanks, everybody, thank for tuning for in. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you for hosting. <laughs> Um, everybody, please give us a like and subscribe and leave a, a comment letting us know what you thought about the episode. Uh, we'll see you on our, all our regular episodes throughout the week, all our shows. Uh, thanks for tuning in and have a good one. Bye. Bye.